before we introduce our special lecturer today, who's going to give you some great insight and in how to um, fulfill your New Year's 2022 chess resolutions, um, let me introduce myself to anybody who's new. I am Jennifer Shahadi. I run the US Chess Women Program, um, and I'm also a, a chess champion myself. So I was the two-time US Women's Champion, and um, we have these amazing classes for the last couple of years to bring all of uh, the girls that are part of US Chess together. Um, so great to see some new faces here today as well. Um, if you're new, um, put the note in the chat because I want to shout you out. Uh, and Nesra Shri is a special guest we have today. Um, she's a new member of our club and she has her own nonprofit called Chess for Girls. She wants to tell you quickly about an event that she has going on on Sunday. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, my name is Nesra. I'm from Portland, Oregon, which is in the USA. And recently I started this Chess for Girls initiative, which is more like a club now. Um, and it's trying to create just like this, the much needed space for more girls playing chess as it is a male dominated sport. And I'm sure many of you have seen when you go to tournaments and everyone there is a guy. Um, so we host monthly online tournaments, which are completely free and they're through lightchess.org. Um, and since so far, many of the players have been sort of beginners, so like under 800 or like even without any ratings, I thought I'd extend it to all of you who have experience playing chess or who are uh, more into it. So if you are interested, there is a tournament coming up this Sunday um, and it will be online, like I said. So yeah, I'd love to see you there if you're interested. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Nishra. I put that in the chat. You can put it later on in case people forget or come late. Also a reminder that we've got our uh, Kenya Girls Club on Saturday. It's gonna be really important. <laughs> we're gonna talk about the mental game of chess. And then we're also gonna have a night or theme tournament and Grandmaster Pontius Carlson is gonna be there as well. So you're not gonna wanna miss that. But with no further ado, I want to introduce a very special guest. Um, this man has been recommended to me by so many people as a great author and coach. Um, my brother raves about his lessons, um, Greg Shahadi, who runs the U.S. Chess School, and he's basically had every grandmaster in, in the country and many in the world come to, through, so that definitely means a lot coming from him, um, and I have also heard amazing things about his books from people like Elizabeth Spiegel, who's known as like the best chess coach in America, so um, I am really very honored that we have Johan here today, Grandmaster Johan Halston. And um, he's going to talk about candidate moves. Um, Johan, thank you for joining us at our Girls Club. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Uh, hi, Jennifer. It's a big honor for me to be invited to this uh, very special place. Uh, I'm thrilled to join you on this one. And yeah, I have some stuff prepared about uh, candidate moves and uh, specifically one technique that we can use in order to find the best choice in a given uh, position. So yeah, that's what I have planned today. I mentioned earlier that Johan's a very well-known author. Um, he does, he has books like traditional books um, and on chess strategy um, and positional chess. And he also has um, books on chessable. So I, I put another poll here. Do you guys use chessable? And Johan, I think you can see the results as they're coming in. Yeah, right? yeah, I can see that. I'm happy to see that uh, many of the people uh, around here today, they are using Chessable. I think that's great because it's a really ex excellent place for chess uh, learning. It's a revolutionary approach, I would say, because it's very interactive. So it means that you can work on different aspects of your chess training and you can actually practice it uh, straight away. Let's say you follow some book by Giri, for example, you can then uh, play out the moves that Giri is suggesting in this or that uh, position. So I think it's a great place for chess learning, Chessable. Excellent. Yes. I mean, it is a really important tool. Um, we've also had people like uh, Greg Shahadi. Um, I'm not sure if any other instructors came to specifically talk about Chessable, but um, Greg gave a lesson on how he uses it. And we'll probably bring in some other instructors in the future to talk more about it. Um, and now I'm going to try to do that first poll, and then we're going to move into uh, Johan's position. My question was, how many candidate moves do you usually consider? So you guys can just answer on your own. Um, okay, so um, Little Grandmaster, aka Madison, says three. Laurel says three. Elizabeth says three. Svetlana. You know why everybody's saying three? Um, Olga says three as well. Welcome, Olga. I'm um, actually, are you Carolina or Olga? 
I think a lot of the reason, by the way, Johan, so many people are saying three is because we have a wonderful coach, Katerina Nemkova, who often has this technique that she makes people pick three moves that they're thinking of before they give their answer. So, yeah, I think that's a great number. Yeah, uh, three is a good choice. Uh, I mean, it's a good number. You probably don't miss anything. Uh huh. So yeah, great, uh, great idea. Three choices. But um, I think that uh, there were there were a bunch of different uh, question possible answers in the ball, and one of them was it depends so much on the position. So uh, that you said was your answer that you don't have a preset number of candidate moves that you consider. Yeah, definitely. That would be my choice because in some positions like, uh, for example, defensive situations, you might only have two choices. Let's say they play bishop takes h7, the Greek gift. You usually have either king takes h7 or king h8, right? And uh, other situations, there might be many choices. Like in attacking situations, you can have many different uh, ideas of bringing this piece to the attack or that other piece. So, um, yeah, it's a complex subject. Uh, <laughs> how many moves to consider, actually? Exactly. Right. Well, we're going to start getting some examples going. Um, so, yeah, and I got the poll to work just just in time for Johan to give away the answer. <laughs> <laughs> I see. I can see uh, that I have uh, affected people's choices here. Yeah. Uh, but three is a good uh, answer also, I would say. That's a great uh, number. Yeah, for training. Um, so are you sharing your screen already, Johan? Or... No, I'm not sharing. Should I share it right now? Yeah, yeah. Right. So uh, very happy to see all of you. Very welcome to this uh, little training session about candidate moves. Uh, that's such a wide uh, topic, uh, candidate moves. Simply we're speaking about uh, choosing between different moves, right? That's the whole definition of candidate moves, but I wanted to share with you a, speci a specific technique that I like to use uh, when I'm calculating. And um, I just wanted to show you very quickly something from a game that one of my students played. So he played with the white pieces e4, the opponent played a Sicilian, and uh, back in those days my student, uh, he used to play this uh, Alapin uh, variation, you know, c3 to go d4 and so, and so on. So black played here d5, I'll show you what is this about? e takes d5, queen takes d5, d4. This is all well known theory. Bishop g4, pinning the bishop. White played bishop e2. And here, black played a minor inaccuracy, I think. They played here to move knight f6. So, before this game, I had uh, showed my student that there is a very important idea that sometimes you would like to go c4 and d5 in this position in order to get a stronger grip on the center. So, once uh, they got to this position, my student with white pieces he hurried to play here the move c4. And the opponent was visibly affected by this move. He didn't expect it. He perhaps thought that white would just uh, cast all away. However, in this game, uh, white played c4. But after a while, the opponent of my student found the good move queen f5. So why do you think that queen goes to f5? Isn't that a strange place for the queen? Well, it turns out that after white's move d5, Black took on f3, bishop takes f3, so that the knight won't control the center anymore. They took on f3 and they put the knight on d4. And after that, white had some minor problems here. As you can see, there is one idea with, with a fork and also sometimes black can take the, the bishop and double white's pawns. And also the knight is fairly strong in the center, right? So in this uh, case, uh, black was okay and the game was later on a draw. However, if we go back to this position, if we know, if we know that black would like to meet c4 by queen f5, how do you think we could, could improve on this variation? Do you think there is a way in which we can make this work in a better, uh, in a better shape, this, this whole idea of pushing c4? Anyone, could you suggest me a move for white apart from c4? Else I can just show you, but you can write in the chat uh, right now if you like. Uh, yeah, it doesn't matter. In, in this case, you can just write it uh, to everyone. It's okay, exactly. So some people are saying the move b3. I guess that's uh, possible. However, uh, we would like a more forcing move. If we play some any move, black might perhaps take the pawn. So we would like a more forcing move. So Kaylin has the right move here. Uh, Kaylin, you can uh, speak up if you like. Uh, how do I do this? I have to unmute you or maybe... Yeah, I thought h3 because it comes with tempo on the bishop. 
And now wow. Black has to Black can't play Queen F5, of course. They have to make the decision to either take on F3 or retreat the bishop. Ah, so let's say I retreat the bishop. So what does that mean? Now that the bishop is on H5, uh, there might be a difference, right? What if you try to play C4 now? Can Black still play in the same way, Queen F5? What do you think? Um, no, there's a fork pawn to G4. Exactly, there is pawn to G4. So thanks, uh, uh, Kaylin. That's exactly what, uh, what I was looking for. That was the answer. If you check opening theory, you will see that actually in this position, what people mainly play is to move h3. Because if black takes, that's a big concession from black. White is very happy to have the bishop pair. And you can see that actually d5 might come up very soon. So if black wants to keep the bishop pair on the board, they will have to play bishop h5, but then white can play c4. And as you can see, we knew that black wanted to play queen f5, but that's not possible anymore due to the fork that Kaylin was explaining. They move g4 and white wins because, yeah, you can see here, white will pick up material in any way. So for the next uh, time my student had this uh, position, he actually got back to this position later on in, in some other tournament. And he knew, of course, that he should play h3 first. So what I'm trying to show you here is this way of thinking. We see something. We discover some possibility, we start to analyze it. We, we look at c4, a very tempting move to play d5. But suddenly we notice that, oh, this queen f5 is really uh, annoying for us because if we push d5 as planned, they can take and they can put the knight on d4. So having taken into account this little detail, we'll include the moves h3 and bishop h5. And only then we will play our move c4 so that they cannot go to f5 with the queen anymore. Of course, they can go somewhere else. Let's say they can go to d7. But in that case, we can continue with our plan. And as you can see, now that the queen is no longer on f5, you can see that the queen is not as actively placed anymore. We can play something like bishop e3, try to take the knight. If they take, we'll take back. As you can see, if the queen was still around, well, in that case, black could have taken white's queen, right? So that's the kind of thinking that I wanted to share with you today, how we can look into a specific idea later on use that information in order to improve it and adjust the idea slightly so let's uh, continue i'll show an example here which i think that there might be a poll also waiting for us so here is our next position and you're playing here with the black pieces let me flip the board you're playing with the black pieces you can see that black is a whole rook down on the other hand please look at white's king there are no defenders close to the white king, right? So that means that we have great attacking chances. I'll give you, I think I'll only give you one minute because I, I know that you're a really smart uh, chess player. So one minute only for you here. One minute, try to establish which is black's best move, please. Oh, and we have some candidates here. Queen h6, queen d6, knight f3, knight takes f2, h5. All right. So uh, take your time. If you're looking at queen h6, please do me a favor. Uh, try to see if there is a defense for white. Try to see if white can defend somehow against queen h6. There might be a defense, you know. Maybe they can bring a piece to defend the king. Maybe the white king is not that lonely after all. So look carefully if we can see how white might be able to defend against queen h6, okay? Maybe there is a way in which white can include uh, some piece, let's say the queen, for example, in the defense, right? That would be great for white uh, to avoid uh, instant defeat, right? So time's running out. And now let's uh, see if uh, we can, how, how do I go from here? I'll close down the... The poll, the right? Okay. And then I, I think Sujana wanted to give her opinion. Um, All right. P please go ahead, Sujana. So I chose knight f6 check. All right. And then if white takes with the pawn, you can play queen h6. All right. In order to give mate, I guess. Yeah. And then if he if they take the knight, uh -huh. you can go rook d6. Oh, that's a nice idea. I understand. You want to play rook g6 to oh. win the queen. Uh -huh. oh, yeah, they, but they have a back rank. Maybe. Yeah, maybe they can go for the back rank. Yeah. I think white is ex escaping here. And also, please notice that they have plenty of extra material. No? 
So yes. even if even if you get the queen, it might not work. Sorry, somebody else was saying something. There's instead of rook e1, there's queen c8, rook d8. Queen oh, d8. you're right. I didn't see that one. Oh, you're of course completely right. I have to drink some more coffee so that I can see those uh, background mates. That's a nice one. Yeah, you're right. So probably we should look for something better, right? Knight f3 is very inventive, but it's not clear that we should give up that knight uh, right now. Kaylin, Kaylin, do you want to answer? Um, I think the answer is queen d6, because after queen h6 immediately, then white could have queen c7. Right. But then if you play queen d6, then white has to play f4 or g3, and then you can play queen h6, and now the queen on c7 doesn't defend h2 anymore. Exactly. Thanks, uh, Kaylin. That's an excellent discovery. And you can see here that the only way really that we can find the move queen d6 unless we are magnus carlson or a player like that we have to look into queen h6 first like we have to look into the wrong move first only when we see white's defensive resource here queen c7 we are actually able to understand why it's better to play here the move queen d6 so we are using the information we're using the information that uh, yeah wrong move leads to the right move but that's a great way to to, to put it, uh, Jennifer, exactly. So we play this funny looking move, queen d6, which at first sight looks silly because, uh, of course, white can obstruct the black queen along the diagonal, either by g3 or f4. But in that case, like Kaylin was explaining, then we have queen h6 and, okay, we can play out a few more moves. Uh, what do you say, Kaylin? How do you continue here? Excuse me, I have a question. Um, knight to f3 check. I oh, that's, that's very pretty, but if you just want to give mate in two moves, uh, what would you play? Um, oh, queen h2 and then queen h1. That's probably safer, yeah. And also you can see here what a nice teamwork, no? The queen is giving check and the two knights are taking away the flight squad. Somebody was asking something, I think. Uh, Anvika, I believe. Anvika? Yes, um, Anvika, can you go back a few moves all the sure. way? I have a difficulty hearing you, but please speak up a little if you can. Okay, when you play queen d6, what if they play f3? Okay, if they play f3, I'm afraid they're not defending against uh, the mate. So I guess you can just uh, deliver mate, right? Uh, both squares. So, sorry? But the knight is defending both squares. Yeah, the knight's defending both squares. Yeah, what a fantastic knight. It's very useful in the attack. Uh -huh. So I get. To, I guess we got it right. No, uh, I didn't follow the chat. I didn't. I didn't have a chance to to follow the chat. But uh, I can see that many people got it right. No, aha. Uh, Liliana is saying that Queen C Seven is the defense resource for White. Exactly. So I guess it's also a little about prophylaxis. No, I'm pretty sure you spoke about prophylaxis previously here. Uh, we have to try to see through our opponent's idea. So only if you can see through White's idea, you're able to spot this move Queen D Six. Let's have a look at a similar example on the same uh, topic. Ah, okay, yeah, so which teacher taught us about prophylaxis? Yeah, I guess that's a question. I forgot. <laughs> okay, <laughs> meanwhile, you're thinking I'll bring up the next example. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. All right, so this is actually a game uh, by two very strong US uh, female players. I think both of them were uh, US champions, if I'm not mistaken, and they're even grandmasters. I mean, uh, in the open category, Grandmasters, uh, Anna Zatonsky and Irina Krash. So these are very strong players and it's interesting to follow this battle because White was winning at this point and they ended up losing. So what I would like you to do here, I would like you to find White's best move. I will only give you one minute for this. I know it's a little fast, but if you just follow the pattern from the previous example, I'm pretty sure that you will find it. So why to play and win? One minute. I'm, I'll be happy with just one move, if, if you like. Uh, you don't have to give me long variations. Just one move is fine. Okay, Liliana, you got it. Uh, great work. Aha, uh -huh. and uh, okay, I cannot, I have to... Annika, I think I got it. Uh, yeah, I know, it's uh, uh, not so much time, no? Uh, sorry, Elizabeth, you got it also. Nice work. All right. Uh, but most people got it wrong, unfortunately. Think about Black's defense and you'll find white's defense. Just like Jennifer said, wrong move leads to right move. So I guess on this one, uh, Liliana, you were the fastest one. So please, uh, Liliana, explain to us how would you continue with white here? 
Queen to h3 to do queen h8 checkmate. Because if you do queen h6, there's bishop f8 defending g7. Yeah, you almost got it right. If, if queen h6, you have, actually have a double mating threat, right? To give mate on g7 and on h8. So bishop f8 won't work because then black is mated on h8. But you were right anyway, because black has a better defense here. How can black defense? Yeah, Kayleen said this. Exactly. We can play here the move e5. So I'm pretty sure that in the game, Anna Zadonski noticed that if she plays queen h6, uh, Irina Krash had prepared to play e5, stopping the white attack. You can see also that if you take the pawn, this is not a good idea. Anyone, why, why is this a bad idea to take the pawn? You um, can just uh, write in the chat uh, or, yeah, please. Um, well, Black will just capture it and after rook takes, um, since Black has a promoting pawn, queen b1 check, a2, A1 is unstoppable. And yeah, okay, it, it's okay, thanks, it's okay, but you can also... But you can uh, also play a queen A1. <laughs> exactly, that's what I was going to say. Uh -huh, you can also play queen A1 and you pick up the rook. Exactly. So, in fact, uh, white is in trouble after the movie E5, black is better. But just as... Uh, yeah, exactly, Svetlana, there will be a double attack. So just like Liliana was explaining, the right move here is not queen H6. It's very tempting for the human eye, of course. Oh, this is what we would love to play in a one-minute game, even... Hikaru Nakamura would think about this to give mate in two different ways. However, there is e5. So if we include uh, this idea in our thinking, if we include the idea of e5 in our thinking, we will find what Liliana found here, queen h3. Very smart move because, again, there is the threat of mate. And uh, what about e5, uh, Liliana? What would happen then? Uh, exactly, uh, Sriya, you're right. Uh, rook hanging, exactly. That's, that's the point. So that's what, unfortunately, White didn't see in this game. Also, I think here we have a common mistake. Once we have this kind of position, we are focusing on one part of the board. I'm pretty sure you talked about this with, with your other trainers. This is a typical human mistake. We focus only on one part of the board and we forget, for example, that this rook might be hanging. This is outside our, our angle, so to speak. So queen h3, very smart move. No way black can defend here. e5 drops the rook on c8. On the other hand, if we play something like king f8, it's easy to see how white would win, right? The rook is still hanging, so we can just pick it up. Exactly. We'll just put the queen on h8 and we pick up the rook uh, next turn. In the game, white instead played the move bishop f6. I mean, the idea is, is great, of course. The idea is great to play queen h6, and now, since the bishop is here, e5 will not obstruct it anymore. But uh, anyone, what do you think Black played after Bishop f Exactly, you're right, Bishop f8. Very smart move in this way, Black defends against Queen h6. And at the same time, if Queen h3, they're now ready Bishop to Bishop g7. Exactly, Bishop g7. So, uh, very strong players. I'm pretty sure they were in time trouble when they played this game. So that's why they didn't uh, find... Uh, that's why Anna Zadonski didn't find the right way to go. But uh, that's what I'm saying. Most people here uh, would consider Queen h6 in the first place. But once you have seen the black resource here, e5, you, understood, you understand that, okay, maybe I could put my queen on h3 instead. Which wouldn't be a comprehensible move in the first place, unless you have checked the other variation. So, all right, I'll bring up the next uh, example. One more example about mate, okay? I'll show you one more example about mate. This is a complex uh, case. It, it didn't appear in the game, but the players then analyzed this game, Spassky and Miles, very, very strong players, Spassky, former world champion. And um, they found that white could win this position in a very nice way. So you're playing with the white pieces here. Um, you have to find a way in which white will win. Please uh, look first at the most obvious move, like Jennifer said, the wrong move. <laughs> and based on that, you can find the right move, okay? Here we go, one minute. All right, Svetlana, you already found it. That's great, in just two seconds. That's a sharp tactical eye. Okay, Jvalanti, that's right. We have two winners already. Can I share my opinion after, um, after Svetlana? Sorry? Svetlana's gonna go first, right? Okay. Yeah, I'll pick them in order. So Svetlana did it in two seconds, so she's uh, the winner on this one, definitely. <laughs> yeah, sometimes also the obvious move can be the right move. Yeah, so it's important to have an open mind simply and look at uh, many different options, I would say. Aha, most people are speaking about rook a8, I can see. 
Uh -huh. So if you look into rook a8, you will find the solution. So wrong move leading to the right move. That's what we're speaking about here. All right, time's up. Uh, Svetlana, please uh, share with us. What did you find? D5. D5? But that's a weird move. Why? What's the point of that move? So after we play rook a8, the king won't be able to escape on c6. That's right. It's escaping. It's able to go to d7 if uh, check by d5, for example. So we should not show our cards, you could say, if you were like poker player like, like Jennifer, right? Uh, very strong poker player. I think that also applies to chess sometimes. We shouldn't show our cards. Would we like to give check here or give check there? We simply won't uh, share that information. So uh, you're right, Svetlana, d5. Okay, let me play one more move here just to try out. If I take the pawn, what would happen, Svetlana? Rook a8. That's right. And now you can see the big difference here. Since the pawn settled on d5, you're right, we'll just give mate on, on a6. And there is nothing else really white can, black can play here. If I play king b8 uh, straight away, Svetlana, what would you play? Um. Yeah, it's my last uh, try. I'm hoping that you will take my knight, because in that case I'll take on c3 and I have some counterplay. I have a check on e3, for example. But uh, you don't have to take the knight, of course. This is about, after all, giving mate. So what would you play? Queen a6. Exactly. Queen a6 and we have an uh, inevitable mate. There is no way they can prevent rook a8. So. I would say that if you have uh, this position, yeah, thanks Svetlana, great work. If you have this position on the board, most people automatically, they will start calculating queen a6 or rook a8 and so on. And they will notice that perhaps this is not working. No, I mean, if we give check on the first place, uh, the king would evidently escape. So only once you have checked these variations, like queen a6 check or rook uh, a7 followed by queen a6, and you see that the king escapes, that's when you notice that, uh, I'm trying to let some people in here, okay. Uh, so that's when you notice that you should actually um, insert this move d5 first, all right? We should insert the move d5. All right, now let's leave uh, mating patterns and have a look at uh, how we can use this technique to win material, which is more common actually in, in practice. Oh, actually we have one more. Yeah, sorry, I forgot about this example. So this is the world's youngest uh, grandmaster, uh, Misra, playing with the white pieces. Uh, maybe it's a slightly more tricky exercise. Uh, oh, we have this one in the, in the poll. Great. So please uh, take your time. One minute as always, because you're fast thinkers. Try to find the best way to go with white here. Um, remember, you can start calculating one obvious move. And based on that move, you can find the, the right way to go. All right. So we have a winner here, I think. We have a winner. Um, at least according to the poll, but I can't see anything in the in the chat. Okay, Jvalanti, you got it. You were the first one, fastest one on this one. Can I share my can I share my opinion? Let's uh, wait for the time to All right. to finish. Okay. Okay, thank so you. We have only one winner so far. Only Jvalanti got this one, uh, so it was a difficult one. All right, please go ahead, uh, Valenti, share with us. What did you notice here? So um, uh, the the most fastest thing that comes to our mind is um, h takes g7. But if you play that king takes g7, queen f7, and king h6, if you go queen h7, king g5, and the king is escaping, yeah, you have a pawn on g6, which can... Uh, which can be a candidate to promote, but there is checks everywhere. Queen b3, exactly. queen g3, queen c2, uh -huh. queen c4, um, all oh. kinds of checks. So, and your queen is out of play. So, if you think about this, the king is escaping at g5, h5, throw the um, throw the fifth rank. So, why not you play king g4? That's right. So if you play king g4 and queen b4 check. There is this very clever hiding place, King G, King G5, or that is even King H5, depending on where you want to play it. And um, there's a Queen A8 checkmate and um, H takes G7 also. So there is simultaneous mates and Queen F7 is also there because there is no check. Right. Um, so 
And what if I play just some waiting move? How would you continue here? Now um, that is this h takes g7, king takes g7, queen f7, king h6, queen h7, knight. Because the king is controlling g5 and h5, while the king can escape. Well, g5, because uh, g5 is uh, where king, the king would have escaped if there was no king on g4. Exactly. That's a great uh, discovery. Yeah. Uh, thanks, uh, Levante. And let me tell you that there is another move which actually also works. Can you imagine which is the other move which would also win the game? Apart from King G4, um, King H. Ah, exactly. You can play King H4, but Misra didn't play that. I guess because simply he didn't uh, want to to be exposed to checks. But uh, yeah. it's actually working in in because the same way that five, you King H4. exactly <laughs> like you say, a nice hiding place for the king. So no way that the black can uh, uh, stop avoid checkmate. Uh, avoid checkmate. I, I mean, I can also try this move on you just to see how you will react. How would you play against that? Just mm -hmm. for fun, let's have a look how you will react here. Uh, that is maybe queen f7. Aha, that's a good move. Please uh, notice here, everyone, don't play this move because then after black moves their queen, you can see that black's king is stalemated. So black could play with this idea of the, the crazy queen or whatever you call it. You give away the yeah. queen so, so that uh, it's a stalemate. So you're right, queen f7. All right, now you can see I'm in big trouble here. Uh, okay, I'll, let's say if I take it. You take it, um, Y takes it, G, F7, and that is, okay, um, and now King, G5. Exactly. So you can see here that uh, White won't uh, agree on getting stalemating black, right? This would be stalemate. Yeah. So King, G5, and if King, H7. Um, promote to uh, Knight? Yeah, that's right. Promote to Knight or to a Bishop, don't promote to Queen or Rook, then it would be... Uh, stalemates. So, but there is now the idea of knight e6 or knight g6. Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah, yeah, now you're completely winning here. You have a huge material yeah. advantage. So, uh, yeah, great, uh, great work. Uh, Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, and that's uh, what happened in the game. So, Misra played king g4. I think in actually in this tournament he became grandmaster. So, this was an important game. He, he bet uh, Hungarian uh, grandmaster in this game, I think. Uh, so this was an important game. They played queen before, king h5, queen e7, and just like Valanti explained to us, there is the mating threat, and that's how I think the game ended. So you can see it's the same technique as in the previous example. In the previous example, we saw how white used the move uh, d5 to somehow restrict the black king, right? It's a completely different picture, but still it's the same way of thinking. So here, like uh, Valanti was explaining to us, here what we're looking at is trying to avoid the black king from escaping. So that's why we play this seemingly uh, incomprehensible move, king g4, right? So that's uh, grandmaster thinking, or well, I would say a strong chess thinking. You don't have to be grandmaster to, to understand this, of course. Uh, but the sooner you get a grip on this kind of thinking, the better, no? The sooner you uh, broaden your way of thinking, you don't only think about moves which uh, threaten something or gives a check and so on the better, no? Because I, I must be honest here, I would probably uh, look into something like, like this. This would be my, one of my first uh, ideas also, uh, because I can see that I win a pawn, for example. But then probably black will have winning, ch uh, not winning chances, no, <laughs> drawing chances, I mean. They can put their queen somewhere, I don't know, where would I put my queen? Good question. Uh, there is no check. But I don't have a check, do I? I, I think I'm, I'm out of checks, but I can put my queen on b7, for example. So... I don't know, maybe I wouldn't find this move so quickly as, as Misha did, but uh, yeah, after all, we're all learners, no? We all have to learn about these important techniques. So King G4, very smart move. We are preparing, so to speak, our mating attack. By the way, I didn't uh, note, uh, mention this, but take the pawn is impossible, right, uh, uh, Um Queen F6. Exactly, Queen F6, and it, it's Queen forced F7. mate, right? Aha. Yeah, right. then king queen. Exactly. Nice. So nice teamwork uh, from the white pieces, no? Very nice. Let's uh, move on. Now definitely time to speak about... Oh, we have one more example on this topic. Yeah, never mind. Let's do it very quickly. We are playing with white pieces. Uh, you can win this game uh, very quickly if you play your cards in the right order. So why to play? Think about the very obvious move and uh, use the logics from last time. Okay, one minute.
Okay, Elizabeth, you got it. That's fast thinking. Great. Wow. Only, only 10 seconds. That's fast thinking. Uh huh. Uh, mm. Yeah, some people are telling me the move that uh, we should uh, <laughs> play a little later. Okay, Yolanti, you got it. Um, Sujana, that's right. Um, many people are saying the move that we should probably not play at this point. Uh, those of you who play who played G6 here, think about what Black will play if you if we play G6. We have to think about our opponent as well, right? We must try to see through their ideas. All right. Um, yeah, exactly, Yolanti. That's true. Uh huh. Right. So, uh, safe to say, Elizabeth, you were the fastest one on this one. Please go ahead. Yeah, right, Tanya, you got it also. Please, Elizabeth, uh, share with us. My idea, um, I played Rook to E6, and the idea was that if I went uh, G6 first, then King to F6, and he would be safe from checks. Exactly. And he could take the F4 pawn. Right. But with after rook to e6, that prevents the king from going to f6. If he makes That's right. any random move, I can just go g6, king to f8, and rook to e8, I think. Exactly. So we have some kind of mating net here, right? Yeah. Now, as you can see, everybody can see that the king was not able to go to f6 anymore because we played this very clever move, rook e6 first. So, yeah, that's the right thinking. Rook e6, uh, great work, uh, Elizabeth. I would say that most people won't be able to find this move if they don't check the move g6 first. That's my wild guess. Some people are saying also bishop e8. That's a great idea. I understand your idea is to mate me with rook e8. However, I think that in this case, I could play here the move rook c8, and I'm still defending. And after all, if I can bring in my knight, I think I might be able to hold this endgame. After all, there is not so much material on the board, and it's uh, uh, only a pawn down, so I think uh, Black can save it. However, in the game, the Danish Grandmaster, he duly played here rook e6. Black tried the last shot here, g6, but of course, White just took the pawn, and they went on to win the game um, with the two extra pawns. Please notice also that when we play the move rook uh, e6, we also prevent the check on h1. That's useful, of course. Uh, Jvalanti, you would like to say something? You raised your hand? I, that's exactly what I actually wanted to say. Oh, really? Oh, that's funny. Yeah, like, uh -huh. yeah, like uh, the bishop was guarding the square on h1, and the, um, you're also defending the bishop on c6. So that's Exactly. It's some kind of nice uh, geometry here from, from White's play. Uh -huh. they, they usually say that bishop and rook is a great team in the endgame, so maybe that's something that we can take into account. Okay, thanks, uh, Yolanti. Excellent work. Now I'll continue with, yeah, this is what I wanted to show you. Um, should we start with this one instead? Yeah, let's start with this one. Uh, it's probably a little simpler to start with. I would like you to have a look now. No mate anymore, okay? F let's forget about mate, but uh, we will look into how we can win material using this technique. So. Please look carefully, you can see that the queen and the knight are a bit loose on the queen side. What does that mean? How can we exploit this situation? Which do you think is the best way to proceed? There is a very obvious move. Once you look into the obvious move, you will find out which is the best way to go. So I'll give you just one minute. Good luck everyone. White to play and win material. Okay, so some people already found the obvious move, okay? Now based on that, let's see if we can uh, improve the variation. White to play and win, all right? Yeah, I get the idea, Kaylin. If you play like that, I'll play knight c4, okay? Against your move. I'm ready to go knight c4, and I think I'm alive. So white to play and win material, or win the game, actually. So this one was more difficult, no? Um, okay, I think Anya and Elizabeth, you have found the right uh, solution. And uh, Hima also got it right. Yeah, we have three winners so far. Anya is uh, the fastest one, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, and I think we haven't heard from Anya yet. Is it Ananya or Anya? Oh, sorry. It's Anya. Anya, excellent, good. All right, time's up. Did you want to give me? Okay. So please, Anya, please go ahead. Uh, share with us what did you notice here. 
It's because um, Queen D3 is threatening to mate at the night. Ah, we're threatening to give mate, right? So, yeah. so black, black must defend against the mate. And uh, what happened now with the situation on the queen side? It's easier to get the knight now. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, let me help you. I think most people, what they looked at here in the first place was the move b4, because it's a very logical move. We try to deflect the black queen from the defense of the knight. However, black has at least two different ways in which they can defend the knight here. One of them would be simply queen b5, that's a safe square for the queen and it's still defending the knight. And also we have a cooler way to um, defend here, queen d5. This is what I refer to as the lifeline. When you offer the exchange of a piece uh, against an opponent's piece which is undefended, in this case the queen, which means that black has time to temporarily leave the knight in the air, so to speak, because white is obviously not in time to take the knight and will take their queen. So they will have to do something with the queen. And if they take, of course, we, we take back with a knight and the case solved. So after b4, actually, black has two different ways in which they can save their skin here, so to speak. They can play queen d5 or they can play the fancy move queen d5. However, like, uh, yeah, maybe, Jennifer, we can speak about the lifeline next turn. I have many examples. I even wrote an article about the lifeline. It's a very fascinating subject, and I think it's not in most uh, books, but it's very, very useful in, in practice. Where's, where's the article? Uh, it's on the chess mode site. Maybe you have okay. heard about uh, chess mode. Uh, it's a free yeah. article, so anybody can can read it. Uh, I, th I guess if you just uh, Google Lifeline and chess, you'll probably come across the article. Uh, anyway, so that's what uh, Anya was saying. Now we include the move queen d3, threatening mate, and now we're ready to go before. Now it's completely different. Black cannot use the Lifeline anymore because the white piece of is protecting the queen. So white is ready just to take the knight, right? And queen d5 wouldn't work either because white would just take on b6. Uh, no, that's wrong by me. Sorry, I need to have another cup of coffee. We should, of course, take the queen first. Yeah, you're right. And then we take the, the knight, right? So yeah, great thinking by Anya. Queen d3 first so that we prepare the move before. Uh, last uh, variation to look at here in the game, black uh, resigned because if queen takes, uh, what would white play? Anyone? Um, rook a b1 or rook c2. Exactly, rook a b1 and we win material. Uh, I don't want to annoy anyone, but please notice that queen c4 would have saved black was it not for the fact that the bishop is defending the queen. So this is a smart tactic to, to look into the lifeline. Yeah, maybe we'll come back to this uh, in the future. Oh, you found it. Okay, thanks, uh, Anna. Yeah, that's the article about uh, the lifeline. By the way, very nice uh, site for chess learning, uh, chess mood. You can have a look at it. Very uh, nice articles and, uh, and so on. All right, let's move on. Uh, what else? Yeah, this is a game uh, where white is very close to winning. There is a very obvious move here. There is a very obvious move which uh, seems like if white will win a piece, but that's not the case. You will have to use that information and you will find the right way to go with white. So a little more difficult this time, but I am believing in you 100%. I trust that you will find a solution. So one minute, white to play and win material. Wow, I, Delancey has got the great chat space. So does Svetlana. I love how the people who left their cameras on are really focused. I hope everybody's that focused underneath the, uh, the camera that uh, the, uh, the the screen. Oh yeah. All right. Those of you who said the move g5, think about what black would play against g5. By the way, you can play bishop d6. You can win the exchange. However, black will be okay there in that position. I'll play knight e5 anyway, and uh, I'm ready to give up the exchange because I'll have a very strong knight in the center. So yeah, I can give you half a point for the move bishop d6, but uh, there is something much better. Oh, I'm, okay, we have a winner, nice, uh, Kavyasri, you got it, please, uh, Kavyasri, could you please explain to everybody what you have noticed here? Yeah, hi, I just hi. thought RD2, if queen, a, queen x a3, there's a discover check, bishop x h7. Exactly, or, yeah. Yeah, bishop takes, and we, we win the queen, yeah, that's part of the, aha, that's part of the solution, yeah, you're right, but what if I go back to, let's say, to b6 instead? 
what is the difference of including these two moves? I mean, some I people were looking at, at the move G5. I, I guess you looked at G5 also, right? This is very tempting yeah. because... Yeah. That's United's... very tempting. Aha, but what would Black play then? They have a counter resource here, right? Anyone? You can just write it in the chat, anyone who would like to contribute. Now the queen can take the knight with check. Yeah, exactly, Hema. That's exactly what this is about. Aha. But uh, someone else who would like to... Or, or you can just write it in the chat, anyone. What would Black play here? Black to play and save their skin. How can that be done? Intermediate move. Exactly, Hema. You got it. Knight e5. That's the right way to go. As you can see, this is a smart intermediate move. The knight was attacked, but now we're attacking the queen. queen. If they just move the queen, our knight will have a safe uh, square on d7. And if they take, evidently, how would black take back? Will black queen take queen the test check? Of check. course, of course. It's a silly question, you might say. But I, I want everybody to understand. So this is the big idea of, from black. They are trying to save themselves by means of this intermediate move. Okay, let's flip the board. So, once we have noticed that the tempting move g5 can be met by knight e5, black is relying on this recapture with the queen, queen takes e5, then we can look into uh, what, uh, yeah, we were discussing. Please continue, I, I don't, uh, who, who, who got it right? Uh, Kavyasuri, please continue, Kavyasuri. Yeah, how... I'm, I'm checking for rd2, you had an answer, right? You want queen b6, to... yeah, so how do you continue now? QB6, now we have... Uh... Um, G5. Exactly. Great thinking. Now we play G5. Everybody, you can see the difference, right? The black queen was deflected from the E5 square, so now, unfortunately, they are losing a whole piece. The knight cannot go anywhere. I mean, I can play knight E5, but it doesn't help me really because, uh, yeah, white would just take. And if we take with the rook, it's not check anymore. So, yeah, we'll pick up the, the knight. So, yeah. Uh, thanks. Uh, uh, great work. Uh, this is how we can apply this way of thinking in situations like this one. We would just love to play g5, but we notice that, oh no, they can play knight e5 and yeah, things get complex. So let's see if we can improve this somehow. Could we add some little spice to the position like rook d2? Um, as we saw here, the queen cannot uh, use these squares. They can actually not use, it cannot go to d4 either, like I'm pretty sure many of you saw, right? It's now in the line of fire along the default, so white would just use the same ta tactical trick, right? So, unfortunately, the black queen will have to move away, and then we play g5. Exactly. So, by the way, if you look at, let's say, Blitz games by Magnus Carlsen or uh, MVL or Nakamura, you will see that they play out this kind of move very quickly, when many others of us, we would play moves like, sorry, moves like g5. I mean, that's the most natural move, but uh, these very, very strong players, even quickly, they can grasp these small details in the position, which can mean uh, a lot of things. By the way, Bishop d6, some people are saying, it's okay, but I'll play knight e5 and I have some counterplay. This knight is very strong, even if I lose the exchange. Uh, so, if you like, we can have a look at one last one. I have my favorite exercise. I think I cannot finish this session without showing my favorite exercise. Yeah, this is my favorite exercise about this way of thinking, how to use information. So, we'll finish with this one, okay? We are playing with the white pieces here. You can see that we're a pawn up. I mean, we're a pawn down. Uh, black is a pawn up. However, black has a big problem with the knight on d3, which is pinned, right? The knight is pinned, so it's in danger. I would like you to find white's best move here. Famous example by Sveshnikov, who unfortunately passed away last year. Fantastic player and opening theoretician and so on. So one minute to go. Please send me white's best move, okay? Think carefully, please. Think about opponent's resources, okay? Think carefully about how our opponent is uh, considering to, to save uh, their skin here. So, Anvika, Emily, Sujana, and Prisha, think about, and Kaylin, think about what Black would play against your move. I would play the same move against all of you. Svetlana, against you, I would play a different move. Uh, <laughs> exactly, Liliana, you're right. Good thinking. So, once you see Liliana's note here, I think you will be able to find the right move for white. Okay. Yeah, and IG5, I can just take it, right? Uh, Prisha, I can just take it. Uh, Zoe, I will then use my defensive resource. 
All right. Uh, I won't stop until you find the right move. I'm just waiting for somebody to find. Okay, Hema, you got it. Please go ahead. Explain to everybody what is this about. Are the knights threatening to go to c5? So if you exactly. play bishop to e3, you're preventing the knight from going to c5 because you can take it. That's right. We play bishop e3 first, and only now we are planning to attack the knight. Okay, I'll play some random move here. Let's say rook c8. What would you play? Queen to e4. Exactly, queen to e4. Please notice there was a last uh, pitfall. Don't use it, uh, the queen, that way, because here black can actually play knight b4. However, if you attack the knight from there, as we can see now, it's already a different story. If I play knight c5, it doesn't work anymore. You can just take it. If I play something like rook c3, trying to desperately defend the knight, what would you play? Um, bishop to d4. Yeah, that's a nice move. Bishop d4 and you will win the game. You will pick up the knight uh, next turn. That's exactly how we should solve this, uh, this uh, little problem. Let's see it from the very beginning. So we had this position. The most tempting moves were, for example, queen e4. However, in that case, black can play knight c5, right? Counterattack. If white takes the black queen, the knight will take the white queen and so on. If we instead play queen a6, black can play in exactly the same way. So virtually any way in which we would like to attack the knight. If we play knight e1, some people are saying knight e1, you can already guess what would black play. Anyone, what would black play here? Exactly, knight c5. So they have this resource all the time. So we have to actually see through this idea in order to find the best move, which is here, bishop e3. And in this way, we are ready to attack the knight next turn, most probably by playing queen uh, e4. Uh, exactly, after rook c8, rook c please notice that knight e1 is wrong because black could then play knight c5. Now the thing is that the rook on d1 is undefended, so that's why it's important to play queen e4. And only after rook c3, here we can play bishop d4, or we can even play now knight e1. Please notice the difference once the rook leaves the 8th rank. If black plays knight c5, what would white play? Anyone? Okay, we'll look into your answer. Exactly, rook takes uh, d8. That's right, because now the rook is undefended, so we win the material here. Sorry, what, did, uh, what if knight c5, rook takes d8, knight b7, rook d7? When did that happen, uh, Zoe? You have to explain to me, at, at what moment? Um, like, right here, like, if knight e1. Oh, all right, all right. So knight e1, you mean... Okay, I, I understand what you mean. Knight c5, you'll take on d8, I'll take on b7. But unfortunately uh, for you, I mean, uh, my knight is... Uh, my bishop is defended, so I can probably just move the knight, right? But your idea was, was excellent, uh-huh. Anyway, so please uh, notice this way of thinking, everyone. It's very important uh, trying to see through your opponent's ideas. We start by the wrong variation, as uh, Jennifer said, queen e4 or anything. We notice the resource knight c5, and based on that, we, we find the right move, bishop e3. Some kind of prophylactic thinking, I would also say. Um, all right, yeah, thanks, everyone. I think that's everything that I had prepared for, for today, so um, yeah. Thank, thank you so much, Johan. This was a fantastic lesson. I, I really learned a lot myself. The lifeline is like a wonderful <laughs> okay. word that I'm now going to remember. Happy to hear um, that. Now, we do have time for a couple questions. If anybody has any questions for Johan. Sure, sure. Come, no problem. You, yeah, while you come up with your questions, reminder that we have a session at 11 a.m. on Saturday. Um, we're going to have a, a session on mindset and psychology. And then we're also going to have a little theme tournament with our friends from Kenya and all over the world. Um, Pontus Carlson will be there as well as me. So don't miss that. Um, it's going to be at about an hour and a half, but if you can't make the whole thing, that's fine. Um, okay, questions. Who's got a question? Raise your hand. Anvika. Um, what kind of chess books would you suggest? Yeah, thanks, uh, Andika. That's a great question, and I think there are many answers. Uh, so many great uh, chess books that you could use. Um, I guess it's a matter of taste also. Um, what what uh, would you like to improve on and, and so on? Um, when I was uh, a kid, I remember that I even picked up my system by Nimsovich, and I also read his book, uh, Zurich, the, 
uh, Candace Tournament, uh, 1953. But okay, these are old books. Now there are many other great books. So yeah, um, difficult to give you like an exact uh, suggestion. Um, what could I say? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I like the books by, by John Nunn, for example. He, he has great books. Um, but there are many other, so, so many good books that you could choose from. Um, I guess it, it depends on your, on your taste and, uh, and so on. <laughs> you you're being too modest you have your own books that are very oh, critically oh, acclaimed right. yeah yeah but Mastery. i mean it's, it's a matter of taste also some books are more entertaining than others um i think there was a great book which, which was called invisible moves which i thought was very interesting uh, do you know about that movie jennifer yeah that book? i had that one i had, I had it yeah it's, jonathan affect right exactly yeah that, that yeah. was a great book i really liked it i i could not stop uh, reading uh-huh um, but also, I could uh, give another answer, Anvika. One kind of book, one kind of book which I think are very entertaining are like biographies. When uh, players, strong players, they tell you about their chess upbringing and so on. I read Bent Larsen's book, for example. Fantastic reading. I couldn't uh, stop reading that book either. Uh, those books are very entertaining. I mean, biographies or whatever you call it in, in English, but uh, game selections, uh, that's another possible answer great fantastic and again he's got a link a chessable link if somebody if you want to put that in the chat johan you can i put it in the email that i sent to everyone um his his books are on chessable and they're also on all the booksellers um u.s chess sales amazon etc uh let's have a question from svitlana is that, is that your name or is that your mom's name svitlana uh can you put your question in the chat i feel like you're freezing a little bit unless it's yeah. me Okay, cool. Um, meanwhile, let's get Madison's question and then we'll get Svetlana's questions in the chat. Um, you might remember me from the US chess classes. Uh, I'm Little Grandmaster, but okay, nice. um, my question is, uh, what was the hardest time in your chess career? The, the hardest time in my chess career? Yeah. Well, I can remember a few setbacks, if that's what you mean. I, I had a bad, some bad tournaments and uh, yeah, I got in a bad mood and so like annoying losses. Uh, uh, I have a few tournaments like that. I think everyone has such tournaments, uh, but I think you should just uh, try to come back and remember that after all, chess is a game and uh, the world doesn't stop because you lose a game even in the most annoying way. And you know, one thing that I learned so many years in chess practice is that every game gives you an opportunity to to create like a masterpiece or play a very memorable game for you so i had such an experience once in the bermuda uh, island i played there many years ago i had a horrible tournament but uh, in one of the last games of the tournament i was able to play a very good game and it's a game which i'm happy with even so many years after that so i, I would say every new game is a new opportunity even if you have a difficult tournament don't give up don't throw in the towel there will always be new games and uh, you learn a lot from your losses also. So yeah, don't worry, be happy or how do you say? Love that. And by the way, I was talking to Laurel who runs our like teen group. So if you're a teen and you want to get involved, do text message her. Um, but Laurel was also talking to me about something similar about how like you don't have to win the tournament to be proud of yourself. And like winning an amazing game is like that like alternate path to feeling really good about how exactly. you did. Love that. Um, Svetlana's question, by the way, was some sharp openings that you would recommend. Like, what are some of your favorite sharp openings? Oh, favorite sharp openings. Uh, there are many sharp openings. Uh, one I could, of course, suggest is the Nidorf uh, Sicilian. It's a very sharp and entertaining Sicilian. The Dragon Sicilian is also nice. If you want to play really sharp stuff, I would even, I guess I would even prefer the, the, the Dragon then because uh, very often you have uh, opposite uh, color, the opposite uh, Castle King, sorry. Um, what else? Uh, the King's Indian maybe with the black pieces, uh, those are sharp openings. So yeah, the Dragon, the Knight of the King's Indian. Uh, what else? Some Gambit maybe. Uh, I don't know which Gambit you like. The Mora Gambit perhaps. Uh, but okay, the Dragon Sicilian would be my, my first choice though. Um, great answers. And um, we have a question from Tanya about when you started chess. Oh, I started at the age of six years. Uh, my father told me, to, taught me. Uh, I, he is not, not a strong player, by the way, but uh, just enough to tell me how the pieces move. And uh, also in my home country, Sweden, there was a TV show. So one famous actor, 
he was showing uh, how to, to move the pieces and I, I thought it was very entertaining and that's how I got into chess at the age of six. We got a lot of great representation from Sweden in our workshops, by the way. If, if you can remember which, which great grandmasters besides Johan we've had talk to us from Sweden, put it in the chat. <laughs> we've had two others, two others. Oh, okay. nice. And uh, let's see, um, let's hear from Marissa. Yeah, hi. Um, I was just wondering, um, what do you, what, like, oh, wait, wait, sorry. <laughs> um, what's your, um, what do you, like, recommend the best for, like, improving? Like, do you, pl like, playing games the best or, like, puzzles and tactics or like, lessons, videos? Like, what do you prefer? Yeah, thanks, Marisa. That's a great uh, question, and um, different people will come up with different answers. But uh, I usually try to convince uh, the person who's asking me about the importance of analyzing your own games. I think that's the most important aspect. Uh, play a lot, of course, that's important, especially the younger, the more games you have to play. Uh, today you have the luxury of playing online. I know that people usually play Blitz online, but uh, actually it makes sense to play longer games online if you can discipline yourself. In these uh, COVID times, it's not so easy to find tournaments, so playing online is, is fine. Uh, however, I think it's important that you check each and every game that you have played. Never leave a game unattended, always have a look at the game. With You don't need a coach for that, some player who is slightly better than yourself, for example, or some, some other student, you can look at the games together. Um, try not to use the engine too much because the engine will always give you specific um, answers but sometimes it's hard to understand uh, apart from this or that move you would like to have like a greater picture so uh, bottom line uh, study your own games analyze your own games that's uh, not my invention old wisdom from what Phoenix days that we should analyze our own games that's the key to success in my opinion learn to about your mistakes and your strengths and so on um, that's the right way to, to go. Yeah, by the way, Pia Kramling, and uh, that's a fantastic player. It's uh, one of my, how can I say, example players. Uh, she has always been a big idol for me in chess. I have always been following her games and I have been very fortunate to play the chess Olympiads together with her, for example. Uh, great player, uh, very nice technique. There is this nice game, by the way, Kramling versus uh, Bogonina, I think, from the World Cup. I showed it at the USCS uh, with Greg Shahadi uh, some time ago. Fantastic rook game if you would like to learn endgame technique from Pia Kramling. And also Pontus Korsson, yeah, another Swedish Grandmaster. Uh, we, had, we also had uh, some time together playing in the Swedish Olympia team. A great player, Pontus, as well. And um, Bea, Beatrice, you, you've been waiting for a little while. I think did, your, did anybody else in your family play chess? Oh, anybody else in my family? Unfortunately, it's not like uh, Jennifer's family. My sisters and brothers don't play chess either. So I'm the only one in my family to play chess. Uh, but uh, okay, I mean, now I have kids also. My son is playing chess. I have a 13-year-old son who is uh, playing chess. So yeah, that's, that would be my answer. But uh, I mean, from my parents and my brothers and sisters, Nobody really plays, uh, plays chess, um, but uh, yeah, I was fortunate that when I was a kid, there were many other uh, kids who played chess So uh, at my local chess club. Back then there was no internet and stuff like that, so uh, I would hang out at the local chess club almost uh, every day. <laughs> so yeah, I had a lot of people around me who also played chess. Nicole, are you still there? Do you want to ask a question either in the chat or in the camera? Yeah, I have a question. Sure, go ahead. Please, go ahead. My question, well, I have two questions. Like, I, my first question is, um, um, like, like, like how, how, like how many hours or like how long do you practice for like each day? And my second question is like, like sometimes like, like, like if you, like, like have you ever gotten like last place in like a tournament? <laughs> That's a nice question. Okay, let's go one by one. Your first question, how long time should you spend on chess a day? I think that depends greatly on your character. Some people are simply more hardworking than others. And uh, yeah, and you might have many other occupations, right? You have to attend school, you have to do your homework, maybe you're practicing some other sport. 
So um, I wouldn't say that you need to spend eight hours a day on chess. Not right now. Maybe once you're a professional, it makes sense to do that. But right now, that's not so important. What is important is that you play tournaments, that you go over your games, like I was saying. And of course, that you work a little on chess, like reading books or chessable or some tactics uh, training on the Internet and so on. A little here, a little there. But um, yeah, it's highly dependent on how much time you have and then also on your your character. Um, so it's not so much about the quantity, I would say, as about the quality. And, and also another important thing, if you have a day like you're not really in the mood to work on your chess, I think it's better that you do something else. Do some sports or, I don't know, music or uh, read a book or watch a movie or whatever. Um, but uh, you shouldn't force yourself too much. Uh, I think it's always important that you feel that you're having fun. So in, on such occasions, it's better to to wait, I think. Now, as for your second question, I was very close to being last place in several tournaments, but um, I think I have avoided it so far. There were some tournaments where I was I was the lowest rated player, but uh, miraculously I was able to avoid last place. But okay, if that happened, it's not the end of the world. Uh, then I'll try to just become number one in the next tournament, right? And also, I have like a really quick question. Um, how many like like how long do you practice for? chess like how long do you practice chess every day how long do you practice chess every day i mean i'm not really a, a professional player anymore i'm mostly working with coaching and uh yes yeah, writing articles and so on but uh, when i was a professional player yeah i would spend quite a lot of time on chess of course um but i mean average maybe during a tournament for sure it's much more but sometimes I would also allow myself a little break. But uh, I don't know, maybe like five, five hours a day. Is, is that possible? But uh, again, there are no rules for this. It depends on your, your character, uh, how, how much time you're able to, to put into chess. So uh, it's up to you. Yeah, yeah, great, um, great stuff. Um, Kayleen, you had one quick question and then we're going to say goodbye. I might have one quick one. Kaylin? Um, hi, my question was, so when you're playing a tournament and say you make a bad move and then um, how do you sort of stay focused and um, not let the bad move that you made get in your head too much and try to focus on um, the game? Well, I mean, it's impossible to, to play good moves all the time. Even Magnus Carlsen will occasionally play a bad move. So if you play a bad move and you notice that you played a bad move, well, I mean, life goes on. Uh, hopefully that move doesn't lose the game for you. And, and if that happens, well, at least your opponent will have to, to find a way also to, to punish you. But I mean, we have all blundered at some occasion. Uh, maybe you remember Kramnik, the w former world champion. He once blundered mate in, in two moves. Uh, this happens to, to everyone, but... Um, I think it's important to be relaxed also. Uh, our goal, of course, is to win the game and also to learn more and become better players and so on. But if occasionally we have like a bad moment, um, that's not something that should uh, depress you. You should rather look for the possible reasons why this happened. Maybe you were not enough uh, concentrated, maybe you were very nervous, or maybe you played too fast, or maybe you were in time travel and you didn't have time really to to focus on, on uh, to, to find the different candidate moves and so on. There are so many possible reasons which can be involved. So basically, no one, nobody's immune to bad moves. Um, if this happens, yeah, it's just part of, of the game, right? Yeah, and um, somebody yeah, asked actually by a chat um, if you were a child prodigy, and I looked at your Wikipedia page and it looks like you actually like really had a very professional progression in chess. It wasn't like, you became a GM at 10, you know, you became an IM at 19 and a GM at 29 or 30, right? I had like, a, how can I say? I was definitely not a prodigy. I was never yeah. in the top top five in the world championships and, and so on. Uh, and I got to like a barrier. There was a moment when I felt I couldn't improve anymore. And then I noticed that I was an international master, but I couldn't become a grandmaster. And that was simply because I hadn't worked uh, hard enough on chess. So I, I actually quit chess at, at some point and I finished my university studies. I worked for a few years uh, at the company. Maybe, you know, Ikea, the furniture company. I worked there for a few years. So I'm a true Swede <laughs> working in Ikea. Weird. Uh, 
Yeah, but that was many, many years ago. But after that, uh, that was maybe a smart move, you know, because in that way, I also felt like the desire to get back to chess. I simply noticed I couldn't live without chess. I remember that I worked at IKEA and I had to go to the Bundesliga German team championship sometimes in the weekends. And I would see my fellow uh, friends that are playing and they were professionals and I would feel that, okay, I should probably get back to playing chess again. So yeah, definitely not a prodigy story <laughs> like Mishra or something. Um, in my case, yeah. a lot of hard work involved. But that's inspiring because a lot of people have busy lives and they're not going to become a GM when they're in high school, but they want to stick with chess and, you know, dream big, even if they didn't, um, you know, play chess their whole, their whole uh, high school and elementary years. So I, I think your story is really inspiring, similar to like Sam Shanklin also um, didn't start as a little kid or anything like that. Um, but yeah, you know, this has been a great session. I, some of you still have questions, but the good news is I think we'll probably be able to get Johan back for a future session. <laughs> so you'll be able to get your other questions answered. And this was fantastic. Hope to see many of you Saturday. Um, but for now, um, turn on your cameras and say thank you and good night to Johan Halston, grandmaster, author, and a fantastic coach. All right. Thanks, everyone. It has been a pleasure. Thank uh, you. I hope you will benef you. benefit from this session. Thanks, uh, Jennifer, for, Thank you. for inviting Thank me. You. By the way, Jennifer, a Thank great you. chess player, Thank former you. US champion, right, uh, Jennifer? You were yes. Yes. I US was a champion. That's, that's great. Yes. Thank you. So I hope uh, many of you can become champions also. It's just a matter of uh, putting a lot of effort and uh, work and, 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 having, and having fun, of course. Bye. Thank you. Yeah, bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank Bye, you. Bye, Liliana. Great Thank job. You. Great job, Beatrice and Liliana and Ambika and Emily and Irina, Shreya. Fantastic. That was awesome. Thanks so much.